This is Robert Mardlachi, the Mind Share of Learning Report, Canada's Learning and Technology e-magazine. And welcome to This Week in Canadian EdTech, Mindshare TV podcast featuring Dr. Michael Barber, Troy University in California. Very jealous of you being down there today, but apparently they had snow. And Dr. Randy Labonte, uh, who is the CEO of Can eLearn, on the Nation K-12 eLearning Canada annual report that they recently released. Thank you for joining me, Jenna. Good morning or Glad afternoon in your time, I guess. Yes, I just got off the lunchtime hockey ice rink, so it is afternoon here. And a um, little bit about uh, Dr. Barber. He's a professor of instructional design and director of faculty development for the College of Education and Health Services at Truro University, California. And he is also one of the founding board members of Can e Learn. And Dr. Levante, who's based in a BC, beautiful BC, adjunct professor teaching online courses for Vancouver Island University and chief executive officer for the Can e Learning Network. Gentlemen, congratulations on your 15th anniversary report, is it? Yes, yes, thank you. What inspired it? Um, well, the report originally came about because, uh, well, I, I guess I'm a little bit competitive. And uh, for the three previous years prior to our first one, there had been a, a report like this released in the U.S. that detailed what was happening in the, the 50 states. And, and you know, being a, a proud Canadian and having that competitive streak, I thought to myself, well, we can't have this. We're doing some interesting, creative and innovative things north of the 49th. We've got to let people know about this. Um, so that's sort of where it came about, to be perfectly honest. Amazing. Randy, uh, your further thoughts. Well, it, it's interesting to to see as we entered into the space. Uh, Candy Learn has been around now for ten years. We took two years of meetings and three years before that of going to the U.S. at the iNACL conference to um, sort of build our own sort of uh, network and rationale. So along the way, we scooped up a number of people in terms of the networking connections. And K to twelve online and blended learning is a pretty small space. And certainly in Canada, um, and also quite uh, easily definable with the network connections that we have in the U.S. with our uh, com com uh, compatriots there. Um, but it's with Michael's sort of uh, reach, and he's persisted in working on State of the Nation himself uh, tenaciously, voraciously, and independently at times. So sometimes he got support for it, sometimes he didn't. So when we formed Candy Learn, it seemed like a natural place in which to uh, sort of partner up with the initiatives that we do and the research that we're doing just through that nonprofit, but keeping it intact. Uh, and we did have a fateful period of time, albeit short, that we tried to put all of the, the data and all of the information from the state of the nation onto the Candy Learn website and it became overwhelming uh, and very problematic at best. So it's an independent research. It started that way. It continues under a partnership with Candy Learn uh, for that, but there's a lot of synergies. And one of the people that got wrapped up into it, of course, is myself as well, working directly. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, and it's a, it's a pleasure because there's a lot of respect that is out in, in this field, certainly and in Canada for the work that Dr. Barber has been doing four years. And for the record, uh, Michael uh, is a Canadian from Newfoundland, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's right. And so what inspired you to make your way down to the U.S.? Um, well, I did my doctorate down here and it was just professional opportunities that, that brought me to... Uh, was that in Michigan? Uh, no, I did my doctorate at the University of Georgia. Uh, okay. My first job was actually in Michigan at Wayne State. Right. And I moved to Sacred Heart in Connecticut, and now I'm over here in California. So I'm uh, sort of trespassing all around the, the U.S. I've got to go to the Northwest, and, and then I'll have all the corners done. It sounds like California was strategic. I did my uh, master's in ed tech at Pepperdine, blended learning, uh, back in 2006. And that seems like I eons ago, and or is it ions ago? Um, but you've come of age with COVID. Uh, 
you know, I felt like I was way ahead of the curve back in the day. And incidentally, we are launching this week our 16th annual uh, Mindshare EdTech Report, uh, which used to be a monthly, now it's a weekly. So we're in good company. Yes, uh, I mean, the COVID has certainly um, accelerated a lot of the things that we've seen over the past, uh, well, I guess, 12 years leading up to when it first started. And it's been interesting to both compare what's happened in the past three years to those first 12, but also see how the last year or so has developed in relation to, you know, that sort of bump in the road, if you will. And what's interesting is the various models for online learning that have emerged. I think uh, I shared your report uh, pre recently and Dr. Uh, Ron Austin uh, developed a model that had seven different options for online learning that have emerged. What, what are you, what, what did this report tell you? And in post COVID, are we seeing the great snapback is Dr. Steve Jordan from the University of Toronto talked about coined that phrase as uh, the potential for educators to want to go back to the way it was. Yeah, well, in terms of the this specific report, I mean, the, the purpose of it is really to track um, the nature of regulation that's happening on a province by province, territory by territory basis, as well as the, the level of activity that we see. Um, some of the trends that we've seen in this particular report, and they've been happening in, in recent years, we've seen a, a greater level of, of centralization that's been happening in most provinces. Um, and post report, uh, that's continued, and Randy can probably speak a little bit better uh, to that in, in a sec. Um, the level of activity, we saw a, a big jump um, two years ago in terms of the proportion of, of students that were engaged in, in formal online learning, not this sort of remote learning that was put up for temporary basis, but actually joining established online programs or uh, districts creating their own online programs for full semester or full year options for students. Um, that level of growth this year has gone back to levels that would be consistent with what we had seen prior to COVID or pre-COVID, sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, so we had sort of a, a nice trajectory sort of going up like that. And we had a big bump with COVID and then it's gone back on that kind of trajectory again. Um, and in terms of, uh, I guess, the snapback and Randy can probably talk a little bit better to this because uh, I know he reaches out to our individual partners a lot more uh, at the program level. But the, the sense that I've gotten is that those boards and districts that were close to making the jump to online and blended, COVID was something that pushed them over the edge and they're continuing that now in a post COVID uh, world. Uh, those that weren't even close to it and weren't prepared for it, those are the ones that you're seeing snap back. Um, so those ones that, you know, were close to the edge, COVID pushed them over. For those that, you know, weren't even climbing up the hill in the first place, um, you know, they rolled back down to the bottom again. Yeah, and, and my, my comment would be, I'm not sure whether snap back is the right term to describe that. We, we, we invent a lot of words in education sometimes, and it has different meanings. I, I think that what happened is there was a lot of emergence into the remote learning. Uh, it was an emergency at first, and it was just trying to connect with the kids and students uh, at a distance. Some refined that and got better at it by taking uh, some of the, the uh, you know, experiences of those, those formal online learning programs, which we were operating uh, before, and then realized that they could support that. Um, others that could no longer support it or realized that the pedagogy of uh, remote learning was not necessarily supportive for the students as well. And parents that wanted some of the custodial aspects that go with uh, with students going into a you know a separate building uh, were were important. So I think there's been a, a return to that, uh, understandably, uh, and but at the same time there has been a lot more awareness with regards to how much can be done online, particularly because a lot of parents now are working remotely as well. They have a, a clearer understanding of the level of communication, the depth of communication that can occur through uh, that, the approach. 
but I think it's important as well that there has been a limited upskilling of classroom teachers to actually be able to use the technologies. And I know certainly in the post-secondary, uh, high right. flux has been one of those terms that's been wandering around um, and it does take quite a bit of skill building. Yeah, absolutely. And who would have imagined in our lifetime that 100% of educators would have used some form of tech-infused pedagogy? That in itself is remarkable. Yes, although I, I wouldn't necessarily say who would have imagined it because um, it, it was over a decade ago we, when we were attending the INACL conference and just getting Candy Learn started uh, that you saw a lot of uh, uh, conversation and even some folks writing um, in academic journals the fact that, you know, this was around the time that, uh, you know, five years after SARS, around the same time H1N1 was coming around. So the idea that you might need to do this kind of thing was already sort of out there in some jurisdictions, uh, particularly a, a number of the Asian countries, were already preparing for these. Uh, I, I remember keynoters at, at the, actually, I think the first INACL conference that Randy and I were at together talking about the fact that, um, you know, Singapore was a country that used to shut mm -hmm. down for a full week every semester to do these e-learning drills because they knew that either because of pandemic wow. conditions or natural disasters that they would need to be forced into this kind of environment. Um, so we had a lot of these countries that were really ahead of the curve on us for this. Um, and we had an awareness of it over here. And it's uh, surprising that we didn't latch on to it a little bit more. Um, you know, the Toronto District School Board had to shut down for three weeks because of SARS back in, in uh, the 2003-2004 uh, school year. Why that wasn't a bit of a wake-up call for folks, um, I'm not sure, but it's, it's a long-forgotten memory for most people. Well, you know, you raise an excellent point, and if I was ever to do a PhD, it would be in the area of disaster preparedness and the impact of ICT. So how do you prepare school districts, colleges, universities, uh, homes to be ready to adapt when schools shut down, right? I, I think, you know, we're well aware that, you know, there's redundancy with, you know, data centers, et cetera, but we didn't really put the time in, in the city. My wife's involved with disaster management in her role as city clerk. So they, they do meet regularly to prepare for such an occurrence. But, you know, the notion of, you know, sustained learning in a crisis was never fully addressed, perhaps in pockets. Did you come across any research like that? Yeah, there were individual examples of places that did better than uh, others. Um, both across Canada and, and worldwide. Um, they're not necessarily featured in this particular uh, report, but uh, right. Katie Warren actually sponsored a series of uh, uh, six or seven reports during the, the pandemic that uh, we called the Pandemic Pedagogy Series uh, that looked at essentially, usually at the beginning and end of each school year, uh, essentially how folks were, were managing and what sort of planning was going in into a place for the coming school year based on lessons that they had learned during the, the previous school year. Um, Randy's much better to, to talk about some of the specific things we pulled out of that and some of the specific examples we found that were better than others. Yeah, I would say predominantly the focus was always on return to classroom uh, right. and health preparations, et cetera, et cetera, for that. Uh, and it was still remote happened if, if it, it happened, but there wasn't a lot of, uh, except for a few jurisdictions that in provinces actually that specifically started to skill up teachers. Uh, and I think it was Nova Scotia that took a week off and they didn't return after January. Uh, and and they, they spent some time helping teachers to be better at, at using a remote learning environment. Fascinating. You know, in, in most cases, it was, you know, learning to fly the plane as you were building it and it was trial by fire and hybrid uh, learning was extremely challenging, especially in the K-12 and elementary uh, panels where, you know, a grade two online, you know, learning wasn't very elegant. And if you had kids in class to do hybrid 
really complex and you need to be, first of all, you need to write tools and you need to be a master teacher that is tech savvy to pull that off. More, more than that, Robert, they have to have an instructional design uh, training and methodology for working in the online environment. Because what happened is teachers went to Zoom school. And so they just broadcast live like that, what they're used to in a classroom. But that does not work in the online environment. No. Yeah, uh, and Larry, you mentioned a, a key thing there, you know, the professional development that was provided. Um, you know, one of the, the critical things I think that didn't happen that, um, and we actually have a special report on the, the State of the Nation site that went up just before uh, the pandemic that looked at teacher preparation uh, when it came to um, online and blended learning prior to COVID. And um, the ability and the knowledge of the nuances of teaching online compared to teaching in a face-to-face -face classroom, regardless if you're doing it synchronously or asynchronously, is something that was really just absent in teacher education programs. So in June of, of 2020, why districts and departments of education just didn't shut down early and say like, there's a good chance we're going to be disrupted in the coming school year. Right. You know, this school year we've kind of lost because we've been shut down since March. Um, you know, let's train our teachers now so that when they come back, they can be ready to go. And that just didn't happen anywhere. Some jurisdictions eventually got to it, and Randy mentioned Nova Scotia as being one of the, the few that actually had a very specific planned out uh, opportunity for it, but it wasn't as soon as it could have been. But, but also, Robert, as you know, at the same time, each province closed schools on different cadences and different times, and at the end of the day, Ontario was the one that had schools closed the, the most in terms of the, the, the time period, but also was not necessarily the one that was training up. But interestingly, what's emerged from that period is a very strong, driven probably by more directly by the policy of two mandatory e-learning courses that parents can opt out of in the province. But that has really ramped up the efficacy and the amount of uh, learning that is going on through the district boards uh, through the online medium, but it is in the already established protocols and methodologies that were in place in those boards. Uh, just now it's, it's expanding. Well, fascinating. Let's lean into the report in, uh, say, you know, three of the top, um, interesting high points that really jumped out, uh, compared to previous years, given the pandemic impact. Um, who's going to take the first stab at this? I can, because I've got three lined up right off the top of my head. Okay. Because um, I've sort of referenced all of them leading up to this, but I would say the, the first one is um, the fact that the growth in online learning across the country really reverted back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, oh, okay. So, it was that, like I say, it was that gradual climb. Then we had, you know, one steep increase and then it went, you know, it's continuing back on that gradual climb again. Uh, the second is a, a trend of increased centralization, which started before the pandemic and has just continued on um, in, in this report and, and subsequent since we've published this report. Um, you know, the 16th edition, if you will, will continue that trend because we've seen some other provinces move into that. Um, and then the third one was actually an interesting one because it's something we haven't seen um, and something we actually haven't even included in the report prior to this. Uh, there was a dramatic increase in the number of programs that were offering or the number of districts that were offering online learning. Um, there were three provinces in particular, Saskatchewan, Alberta and Ontario, where we saw significant jumps. Uh, Ontario, really. Um, and I think Randy touched on the, the mandatory the graduation requirement for two e-learning courses a second ago. Um, I think that's brilliant. They were pushing for four pre-pandemic. Yeah, so and settling and, in on two is a nice compromise. Yeah, and and it's 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 not in the districts that are doing this because there's roughly the same number of districts that are involved in it. They've just expanded their programs. The number of private online programs in Ontario has gone from you know a dozen to a dozen and a half to upwards of 160, 170 of these programs right now. 
Um, you know, so that's uh, almost a tenfold increase that we've seen um, wow. in that province. Uh, whereas in the other provinces, you know, we've seen in, in Saskatchewan, I think it jumps from 26 to 30 something to or 40 something. And that's Alberta, sorry. And in Saskatchewan, I think it goes from high teens to high mid 20s to high 20s. How has this impacted the future of faculties of education and how they prepare their students? <laughs> how has it or how should it? <laughs> <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Yeah, what have you seen any innovative models that have emerged post pandemic around faculties of education, be it Canada or the U.S. or internationally. Do you want me to jump in on that one, Mike? Yeah. Nick, okay. you can go to the first start there, Randy. Okay. But, because so, clearly something needs to be done. So, so when you're talking about faculties of education, uh, I think it's really important to boil it down to pre-service teachers and post-in-service teachers. So we've seen a growth of a lot of programs that are for teaching teachers uh, how to how to be and work online uh, for that. And, but that's a lot of in-service teachers that are taking them and they're typically diplomas or master's programs. And every university that's worth their salt is probably offering some kind of a degree program uh, to that extent. And to be honest, those teachers are come out pretty well skilled and understanding how to leverage technology, but more importantly, how to design learning experiences using technology through the medium so to use Tony Bates as an example, they understand the affordances of each of the environments. And in some cases, they will do things synchronously, like we are doing here or and record, or they will do it through a learning management system that tracks some of the content materials, the assignments, et cetera. So they understand that. Pre-service, they get some technology training in part of the program. Do they really get into any of the pedagogy, the working, or even at that, any practicum with an online school? Non-existent. Yeah. Well, hey, hence Randy, that, that, the key, you know, the pre-service level is the key because right. while a lot of our teachers do go back and get graduate degrees, um, they don't start out that way. They all start out as, as Bachelor of Education graduates for the most part, and then they enter the classroom. And so many of those folks, um, within teacher ed they they talk about two ways of providing technology integration courses one is a standalone course and, and i think we've all had the experience with this one where you went in and they taught you how to learn how to use the tools a little bit but they taught you nothing about actually how to teach with those tools right um but that was still better than the other model which is what they call the program wide program deep where um, in theory, every single faculty member is integrating and modeling the effective use of technology in their own classroom. Um, I think right. we've all sat in classrooms in, in our old former ed programs, and I think, um, you know, all those listening would attest to the same thing. The level and skill of technology use of many of the faculty that we've had to sit through throughout the, the various education degrees we've had is questionable at best um, in most instances. So thank you for that. Talk me through this map, this visual here. I, I sense that a lot of the um, innovation that happens is regionally driven by uh, climate or terrain, um, weather, uh, location. Yeah, so this particular map here is um, one that we've used since we started it. And actually, this might be the last year that we use it. Because how has this changed? It's it's becoming a little bit more problematic in terms of how we describe it. So okay. what you see here is those that are in red are pro provinces where it's primarily a centralized program. Okay. Um, those that are in blue are provinces where they are primarily district-based or regional programs. Okay. Uh, those that are in purple have a combination of the two. Uh, those that are in green are ones that just use stuff from other provinces. And you'll notice the other two territories there okay. are striped red because they still use stuff from other provinces. Um, but 
the the difficulty with that is like if you take a, an example like Ontario, you know Ontario has primarily board based programs. You know the school boards have run their own programs. Having said that, there's a large private school presence there that operate not just province wide but can actually enroll students from anywhere in the world. Uh, you've got the independent learning center that operates province wide. Sure. Plus, because of these regional consortiums that have set up, like the Ontario e Learning Consortium and uh, Califlow, the the francophone version, really it's not uncommon to have students from anywhere in the province enroll in a course in your own board. Um, you know, Randy will be able to to talk about you know the changes that are happening in BC, but um, prior to those changes any online program in BC could enroll students while they were run by the district, they could enroll students from anywhere in the province. Um, wow. Starting with the changes we've seen in the last couple of years, yeah. they have to indicate whether or not they're a province wide or a district based program now. Um, but even then they're still operated at the district level. So one of our difficulties is the map presents a, a view that doesn't capture the full complexity of what's happening. Yeah. Uh, well, well said, well said. And so, Randy, I always had this perception based on not intuition, but having experience being out in BC, being in the West, that, you know, you guys are more trailblazers, risk takers, and embrace online learning earlier on. And some of it had to do with regionality and mountains and things like that that get in the way and small pockets uh, of population I, I would say that it's more self-made uh, in the sense that because okay. the population is more spread out you kind of either got to do it on your own or it doesn't get done so to speak whereas right. in in say again bc versus ontario in ontario there was a strong centralized approach that put some of this stuff together <clears throat> and and created it but in bc that the, you either did it on your own or you collaborated with a couple of close peers and the consortium model is the one that exists in the west that does not necessarily exist in the same structure in the east when we talk about the ontario e-learning consortium it's based on doing something related to coordinating the delivery but they're not involved necessarily as 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 much in bc in terms of actually building the resources sharing and hosting an lms none of that was provided centrally in bc so they had to make it up themselves so i would say trailblazing perhaps but because they're self-made i think that the right. natural tendency is to expand it as, as far and wide as, as you can and that's what's happened in bc and one program in particular started at a very small uh, rural central you know province area and was de facto became the the provincial sort of only program that did everything uh, available to students. Thank you for that. So any big surprises uh, coming out of this report? Um, things that we could do better? You know, what are what are a couple things that that we learned out of this report that uh, we need to really maybe drill down further from a research <laughs> perspective? I, I policy. Say, yeah, what well, policy certainly the policies are changing, but they're driven by a lot of other factors. But I think incontrovertibly from the research that's been going on and as, as mentioned as well, the pandemic research is that we have to scale up teachers. They have to learn and understand how to use the environment. And I think that goes all the way back to the pre-service comment and discussion we had, but also as an ongoing basis. I, I think that any teacher right now should be aware of how to utilize and employ the online learning environment to the best extent that they can based on the students that are in front of them. And there is no one model that fits for that teacher because they're all in very unique sets of circumstances, despite being maybe in a community. They have unique students with different needs and some can have the affordances can take it, others can't. So I think the skill set and the disposition needs to be instilled in our pre-service teachers and then expanded upon as we move forward as teachers are in practice. Yeah, I think it's 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 
ironic that you stopped on this particular image while Randy was talking because it actually goes quite well with one of the that key takeaway that he just mentioned that we've learned over really the last couple of years because as you're looking at this you know phase one is basically what happens in March and April of 2020 you know it's like the 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 oh my god moment what am I doing um you know that phase two is really where everybody got stuck and the largest reason for that is because teachers really weren't um, prepared for and weren't uh, didn't receive professional development initial teacher training to be able to get the phase three because phase three is, is going that back and forth it's referred to as your toggle term or your toggle semester where you can toggle back and forth between face-to-face -face and remote learning um, asynchronous and synchronous without losing any continuity of learning or having been able to deliver with the same quality of instruction Right. And, and I think we'd all be hard pressed to find too many examples of schools or school boards throughout really the world that could be face to face on a Friday afternoon and have an announcement come across the PA, letting them know that we're going to be closed on Monday because on Tuesday we're going to resume remote learning. And for the teachers and the students to be able to switch like that and have the same quality of teaching and learning that's happening. Um, and, and that's why we never really got to phase three throughout the pandemic uh, as right. we were looking at it. And now we're sort of jumping over into phase four, which is, you know, what is this new normal going to look like? And, and I think in order to be ready for the next time this happens, uh, you know, Randy's observation is, is on point. You know, we need to make sure that our pre-service teachers are, are at least have a modicum of ability to handle this and that our teachers that have, uh, you know, in-service uh, training, um, you know, are well prepared for this environment. So are you telling me then that snow days are not going to be a thing of the past in the near term? Not in the near term, no. <laughs> I, I fully anticipated some districts saying we're moving online with some of the recent storms that we had, but apparently we, that wasn't the case. We've seen that in, in the media in the U.S., but I can tell you for a fact, Vancouver got hit with snow this morning and the North Shore uh, school districts, uh, West Vancouver and North Vancouver, shut down. No, no, no remote learning, no other requirements. Go out and toboggan, kids. You know, sometimes you just need to play. You know, you just need to, like well, I did at lunchtime, The school go play. year is built to right? accommodate some of those short-term closures. Mm -hmm. You know, the question becomes, um, it, while it often gets overshadowed by the pandemic, most folks forget that in January and February of 2020, uh, Newfoundland had like, you know, five or six feet of snow. And if you remember, St. John's was closed for two weeks straight because wow. they couldn't get, you know, the snow That's cleared. That's crazy. A couple hundred year old city. Um, you saw pictures online of people that, you know, were digging these trails from house to house. And, you know, the trails were as tall as what the, the people were. Um, you know, so I, I think that snow day for a day or two will continue. Um, I think the ability to transition to these remote settings when it starts to become a week, two weeks, three weeks, that's, I think, where this is going to start to become more important. I agree. Well said. Thank you for that. And so in final analysis... There's, there's much that's emerged out of this uh, pandemic that has impacted the state of e-learning, uh, but we have a long way to go. We're still at pockets of innovation. I've been talking about pockets of innovation for the last 15 years. What's next? Or, or uh, you know, education moves at the speed of trust, it's been said. <laughs> Fair enough. And I think that trajectory, the slow trajectory about more and more uh, boards and, and, and kids being exposed and working in the online environment, I don't think that trend is going to go away. Uh, we're seeing that happen in all aspects of our society. And so education tends to reflect that as opposed to lead that. Um, so I don't think that's going to change significantly. And probably the one takeaway for me that, that is there is the 
parent, parents have a better understanding of what an online environment can afford their students and they will not give it up. And so there were some that were trying to close other programs and the uh, parents were advocating for their own children and found a way in which to make it happen. So I think we're moving forward, albeit as slow as education at the speed of trust. And, and thank you for that. And I will qualify something uh, about private schools. And I recall as the pandemic was happening, one of the schools, uh, private schools wanted to offer hybrid. And this was something that was going to continue beyond the pandemic was the plan because if kids are traveling with their parents and on a learning vacation, if you will, that they could sustain learning. So, and it's a differentiator for those private schools in many respects. Yeah, I think- Was the, this something that you observed? Yes, um, you know, I, I think Randy is spot on and it, and it does go into, you know, your observation that, uh, you know, there's a, a much broader understanding of what online learning can offer. Um, the flexibility that it can provide to certain students, the second opportunity that it can provide to other students, the alternate setting or the alternate education environment it can you know provide to a third group of students you know so you're starting to see this this better understanding of you know that there are different types of online programs there are different ways to offer online and hybrid uh, and blended learning and it's a matter of finding the the right type of program to meet the needs of a specific type of student um, the one thing that that i do fear coming out of this and um Unfortunately, and, and this is something we hadn't seen in Canada prior to uh, the pandemic, um, online learning had tended to be something that really had widespread support. Uh, you know, unions were in favor of it. Uh, many of them had, uh, you know, policy statements that were suggesting that all students should have the opportunity to do this. Um, you know, the parents that were engaged in it were in favor of it. Uh, school boards were in favor of it, those that were involved in it. Um, because of some of the, the the shoddy remote learning that we saw, particularly in the earlier stages of the pandemic and particularly in jurisdictions where they didn't take the time to prepare their teachers, there's really been a, a, a backlash around the perception of what online learning is. Um, and I, I think folks in the field really have to do a good job now of, of educating um, the, the public as a whole, the differences between, you know, traditional planned online learning and that sort of emergency style remote learning that we saw. Um, and that, you know, one of them are, is a very good thing and can offer a lot of opportunity to folks. The other is something that we should look to avoid at all costs the next time this, this type of thing happens. Well said, Dr. Barber. Gentlemen, any final thoughts to share? And I think the sharing is the most important part, the, the storytelling and the inspiration that your research provides and, you know, to help us get beyond these pockets of innovation, because I will never stop. I'm on a mission. You know, I had a wonderful experience doing an online blended master's degree that changed my life dramatically in what I'm doing today. So kudos to you for your passion and the impact that you're making. I, I think I Robert, the, 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 so I'll let Randy have the last word here. Um, the, 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 the request out to the group in your network is that if you've got a story to tell, let us know. We'll publish it. We'll bring some light on it because I think that the more that we share, the more we'll understand. And we really appreciate the opportunity to be here on, on you know, this weekend at, at Canadian at Tech and, and the relationship that we've had with Mindshare Learning, I think is 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 important. And those are the, the valuable things that we need to continue to pursue. Well, with that, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time this morning, my afternoon. Good, thank close you. To the afternoon here. <laughs> that was Dr. Michael Barber, uh, Professor of Instructional Design and Director of Faculty Development at Toro University and Dr. Randy Labonte, who is the uh, CEO of uh, Can -E Learn, on the recent release of their Can -E Learn uh, State of the Nation K-12 e-learning K-12 
Canada annual report. And you can find that report, gentlemen, on your Can eLearn website or at, uh, you have a separate site. K- K-12 State of the Nation. K-12 State of the Nation. S-O-T-N dot C-A. So. Awesome. Thank you again, gentlemen. And this concludes our Mindshare TV podcast today. Be sure to check out Triple W Mindshare Learning to get your latest issue of the Mindshare Report. And until next time, stay healthy, stay safe, and keep the learning curve steep.